Welcome to the Pure Passion Podcast with Dr. David Kyle Foster. This podcast and our many other resources are made possible by our donors. Please support this ministry by going to our website, masteringlife.org. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is David Kyle Foster, and I'm your host. Today, we have a guest from Bethel Church in Redding, California. His name is Ken Williams, and he is one of the co-pastors at Bethel Church and the founder of a movement called Equip to Love, as well as a part of the Changed Movement. And Ken, just briefly tell us what those two are. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, David. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Uh, yeah, those are two ministry. It's, it's really one ministry uh, that has a movement. So Equipped to Love is the ministry out of our church uh, that I co-founded with Elizabeth Wanning uh, several years ago, and it is specifically trying to minister to those impacted by LGBTQ issues and also to equip the church to lovingly navigate those issues in people's lives. Um, and we were minding our own business, kind of, you know, launching that ministry and starting to minister to more and more people and equip pastoral leaders uh, when a bill in California would have made our ministry uh, illegal, basically, and every other ministry like ours or like yours, David, in different ways would have been canceled. And so we ended up uh, testifying. It's a longer story, but ended up getting pulled into actually testifying in legislative hearings at the Sacramento Capitol uh, and pushing back against that bill that would have squelched the gospel, squelched religious freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and forced only one ideology. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, we did that. And in, in order to really mount an effort against that bill, ended up recruiting our friends and saying, hey, could you share your testimony too? We put a book together called Change that featured a bunch of, this, a bunch of different stories of people leaving LGBT as they followed Jesus. Yep, there it is. There you go. And you're in there, David. And by the way, I'm in here, so you've got to buy it and read it. That's right. That's right. And, and so, Ken, go ahead. No, that's all right. So, we took those books and we rallied on the Sacramento Capitol steps um, during that pro that time period where that bill was being considered, and um, it was videoed and went on YouTube and on uh, social media. And went viral because it was a bunch of people sharing testimonies that you don't normally hear on Capitol steps in defiance of a bill. And um, so that bill miraculously ended up getting shut down. It ended up being with, withdrawn by the man who sponsored the bill, which is a gay man himself and a legislator and the head of the LGBT caucus in California, he withdrew the bill. And so that whole, the, all of that and the testimonies having gone over the internet um, went viral. And so now there's a movement of about 3,000 people in a closed Facebook group called Changed Movement that are just journeying together in, away from LGBT and deeper into Christ. Um, probably over half of the, that group actually have testimonies themselves. The other ones are parents and loved ones and mm. that kind of thing. So um, I co I co founded and co lead both of those ministries. Ken came out of the gay lifestyle, and the book we're going to talk about today is called "The Journey Out: How I Followed Jesus Away from Gay." I love this book. I just <laughs> love it. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> you will not be disappointed if you get this book. What's your website where they can contact you and maybe get the book? Yeah. They can go to thejourneyout.me and I'll send them a signed copy if they want to do it that way. You can also find it at Barnes and Noble or Amazon, different places. Um, yeah, Equi equippedtolove.com also is our ministry um, website. Okay, so Amazon still lets you be on. I'm not canceled on Amazon yet. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> well, I want to start with a quote from you from your book. Um, you say, I know many people who have left LGBT behind, and what is clear is that Jesus has been at work in similar areas in each of our lives, mm -hmm. healing our emotional wounds, replacing lies we believed with truth, drawing us close to himself, and helping us build life-giving relationships. I mean, that sums it up so beautifully. Uh, then you go on to say, 
I did not, I didn't have a sexuality problem as much as I had an intimacy problem. Yeah, man, that is so insightful. Talk about that a little bit. Mm. Yeah, gosh, so much to say there. But my, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, in the in the times when I would find myself just really sexually aroused by another male, if I were to stop and think, what am I really wanting from him? You know, what what is this draw? If I pause you know, like maybe in an inner healing ministry time where someone's ministering to me about, if I stopped and really paused about what do I want from him, I wanted him to, I wanted a strong man older than me to pick me up and hold me and pull me close, which I know probably sounds super weird or awkward or something, but I'm telling you that that bonding and that attachment and that nurture and connection and all that stuff got disrupted for me in my childhood by various different ways that we could talk about if you want. But I, I didn't, I don't think I got enough of that. Like there's a reason, you know, it, the, children can have what's called failure to thrive when they're infants, if they aren't held, yeah. like the physical touch even. And yeah. so, you know, my, mine got sexualized at uh, about eight years old or so because of pornography, hardcore gay pornography, that I saw that caused me to lose all respect for men because I saw, you know, what people don't know that you'd know probably David is like the world out there of homosexual sex and um, pornography um, between two men is very often violent, mm -hmm. very uh, domineering, disrespectful, dishonoring. Um, and the things I saw men doing to each other w were, I, I could not understand why a person would treat another person that way. What yeah. I was seeing was not merely two people in love with each other and expressing it physically. I was seeing something different and that wounded me. Plus I was the, the scrawny skinny kid and I already was mocked for not being as strong as the other boys, but you put all that together and I just canceled masculinity and pushed it away. Mm -hmm. And so I was starving for it, David, like, you know, and you went like, there's only two options, contrary to what society wants to say, biologically and biblically, there are only two options for how you can manifest in personhood, male or female, down to the chromosomal level. And so if you've pushed your masculinity away and you're male, what are you left with? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like I mean, I was searching for me and yeah. And, you know, and, 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 I, and it was so much easier to see it um, in another male. And so, but, but I was long, I had pushed it away. I hadn't bonded enough with my father, with my male peers. And so I was starving just for that intimacy that you mentioned, like to feel close, to feel known, mm. to feel valued. Mm. I was not getting those things and mine got sexualized and, um, and, and that's kind of where my story began. Yeah, I had a similar experience, uh, father wound, uh, looking for male affirmation, mm -hmm. afraid of intimacy, uh, which, by the way, is one of the core issues with heterosexual sex addicts. Yeah. I mean, the basis, really, yeah. uh, of their going to safe prostitutes or whatever, pornography, is to avoid the, their fear of real intimacy because in the fake intimacy of pornography they're not going to reject you and so you're not going to feel pain whereas in the real world uh you often feel pain right um the first time i was uh picked up by a man i got into the car and he looked at me i was about 18 or something and he looked at me and he goes you're beautiful and i was totally trapped from that point on because wow. i was starving for some father figure to say that to me and to affirm yeah. me i would have done anything he wanted from that point on yeah so that's how powerful this lack of affirmation mm -hmm. and fear of intimacy and uh all kinds of things that we'll be talking about is let me read another quote from your book you say when we exhibit unwanted behavior in our lives the temptation can be to begin to focus entirely on changing or stopping that behavior, controlling our actions through sheer willpower. Mm. 
Instead of realizing that unhealthy behavior is the mask that unmet need wears. So if our behavior needs to change, we need to discover what need that behavior is attempting to meet. And I guess you just really described that, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Don't you think that's what happens? It's like we're crying out for this relational thing. And so we end up just trying to get it sexually but it can it can never scratch the itch because that's it's not it's not a sexual problem it yeah i'm trying to actually meet a genuine need of of affirmation affection just being i just needed to be validated as you are a legitimate male yeah. you know when you put when you separate from all of the other males which is mostly what i did i just kind of hung out with the girls it's very hard to feel like you're a card carrying male if you're right. never around any. Right. Well, and then, you know, when I first got saved, the whole world is steeped in performance orientation. It's, it's yeah. all we're taught from grades to yeah. awards, to trophies, to, you name it. It's all performance oriented in this world. And so when I got saved, my first reaction was to fix myself and to, figure out what was wrong and then figure out a plan to stop. You know, it was all me trying to figure things out yeah. in my own power. So this, this in, impetus that we have to do it ourselves is sending us in the wrong direction, isn't it? A hundred percent. Don't you think that's why we see so many that are uh, destitute, like L- people that find themselves with LGBT feelings and then you, you find them so bankrupt emotionally or, or like fighting for, you know, gay pride or whatever. It's like they're trying to find identity in this thing, but you can't actually, they're trying to meet needs through sex mm-hmm. and um, it doesn't work. And man, we, we've got to be, uh, love is actually helping get the needs met instead yeah. of just saying, yeah, you go be you. It's like, well, a lot of the times we don't know who we are. And uh, so, uh, yes, we, ha- we have to actually really show the kind of love that sees a person and is able to start to meet needs that are, are there and realize that there are needs underneath the desires that people are feeling. Let me read another one of your quotes. Yeah, sounds good. We cannot point to one singular cause of same-sex attraction or sexual identity confusion. Each individual is unique. And what might deeply impact one person may not influence another in the same way. Mm -hmm. The common thread I see is that people's experiences of intimacy, their senses of love, value, and belonging, somewhere along the way were damaged. How does that occur? How does that damage occur? And what does it do? Yeah, well, I, um, yes, I think in so many different ways, I'll I'll skip to what I think the underlying thing is. We'll see if you agree with me. I believe that so much of homosexual struggle, it can be described this way. So it's an intimacy breakdown that the enemy capitalizes on. So it's not so much what happens to us. It's what the enemy tells us when that happened to us. Yeah or right after that happened to us. Yeah. So, you know, I, I remember just even in the last couple of weeks, I've had a couple of conversations that stand out in my mind with some, with some men that are on a journey of finding out who they deeply are. And um, one of them was in fourth grade and he had never used a urinal before. And here he is at school. And for whatever reason, he'd never used one before. And now he's going to try to use the, ur- the urinal. Well, when he does that, he's fumbling because he doesn't really know what he's doing. And the other boys notice that he's insecure there or fumbling and they start mocking him. And that is, was the seminal thing that for him, the enemy lied to him and said, see, you're, you're a form. I forgot the language that the specific lie, but the gist was, see, your form of masculinity is illegitimate. This, you're not actually one of them. You, you're disqualified, you're less than in your masculinity, all those things. That's one example. Uh, another example is um, uh, a man that when he was around eight years old, 
he was pretty girl crazy, as he recalls it. And he uh, tried to kind of, you know, get a girlfriend in this other young girl. And she's this beautiful little girl and she rejects him. And then a short time later, he got rejected by another cute girl. And he thinks to himself, or maybe the enemy plants the idea in his mind, um, I'm not going to ever be good enough to be able to be valued as a male with a, a female, um, probably in child's terms there, but it, you, get the, you get the comparison there. I, I'm not ever going to be able to meet the, the grade here. And so I, I, don't, I want to be near these beautiful girls, so I will just kind of become one of them. I'll just start kind of hanging out and being in that circle so that I can be with these cute girls. And over time, though, he became more like identifying with the girls just off of that lie, that intimacy wound that happened there. I mean, maybe it's not a big T trauma. He wasn't sexually abused like so many of our friends, David, right, have been. But that was a trauma for an intimacy trauma that, wow, I am in inadequate as a male with a female. I mean, yeah. there's so you and I could tell hundreds probably of, of examples of the wounds that can happen. And, and, that, and I haven't even started talking about being sexually violated or when a young girl witnesses her dad physically abusing her mom or sexually abusing her, and therefore she pushes all men away. I will never have anything to do with an, you, you know, there are so many ways that the mm -hmm. enemy can plant lies. Um, and especially if you don't know that it's possible to hear the Lord and to find what the Lord's saying to you through scripture too. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to go off course and not ever realize it until years later. So you really have to ask the Holy Spirit to show you what the lies are. You do. He knows exactly what they are. He does. And yep. then after he tells you what they are, he'll probably encourage you to say what's actually true, to mm -hmm. renounce the lies that you've been believing, yeah. and then uh, practice thinking and saying what God says is true about that situation. Yeah. I mean, I feel like so much of the time, you know, it's like Jesus only did what he heard the Father. He, he only said what he heard the Father saying, yeah. and he only did what he saw the Father doing. Yeah. And I feel like that's our, uh, that's what we're called to do too, is to be about our Father's business, to know Him through His Word, but then also just through the voice of the Holy Spirit to understand, okay, what is God doing in me or in this person that I'm engaging with, and to cooperate with that. So right. if the Lord has been, you know, if the enemy has been telling me, you know, you're a girl, I mean, we know today, right, David, that it's like, it's uh, not uncommon, sadly, for a little girl to be told, well, actually, you're a boy, or to believe that, that she's a boy. Yeah. And so, you know, a whole house of cards gets built on, on that in the mind. But if we can partner with what is the Lord saying about that little girl to her? What is he, what's he affirming? What's he saying? Yeah. And we can align and partner with that. There's all kinds of different ways we can agree with what God says about us, which I think starts to uh, transform us by the renewing of our minds. Like we start to partner with the truth and we let go of the things that God did not say, but actually the enemy tried to say. Yeah, and I found that uh, many homosexuals, I mean, the vast majority that I've met, um, their temperament is more sensitive than the norm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what happens to them impacts them more deeply yeah. than the same thing happening to another person. For example, mm -hmm. I was in a family of four boys. I'm the one who ended up with homosexual confusion. The others didn't. What made the difference? Well, one yeah. of the differences was my sensitive temperament. Right. And that caused me to go into all kinds of uh, imaginary worlds. I used to pursue girls who were way out of my league. <laughs> <laughs> so I was getting constantly rejected because I was, yeah. you know, I was in this fantasy world of wanting, you know, Miss Princess. And yeah. She wasn't available. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that I think that's really real. And I'm and I know you and I are not the only ones who've tried something like that. I mean, that was an example of my friend and the and the pain that was there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you also say in your book, uh, I was struck on a ham I was stuck on a hamster wheel, cycling between deep shame and deep hunger with seemingly no way out. 
Mm-hmm. God felt like a distant judge. I felt broken, fundamentally flawed, and constantly disappointed in my attempts to change myself. And this is a part of uh, believing lies. You feel mm-hmm. defective. You feel unlovable. You feel mm-hmm. flawed. Uh, is that what you experience? Mm-hmm. So much. I mean, just every day. And, you know, it's it, the world out there is screaming, just be who you are and just embrace your gayness and all that. I'm like, well, if... <laughs> If that even worked, that would be one thing, but it did not, it did not work for me to even try to go that way because again, my needs were emotional and relational. And so, you know, the times that I did, you know, step over that line and had some kind of a somewhat sexual engagement with whatever uh, young, young man or, uh, you know, young man that I was fixated on, it was never enough. I mean, you know, in my teens at one point, early teens, you know, I ended up this codependent emotional connection I had with this other uh, friend. Um, we just started sharing so deeply emotionally. We, we, we both had trouble connecting with our fathers. And I mean, I just started to find myself in him. Like I much preferred him over me. So I was kind of canceling me and saying, oh, this is better and trying to find myself there. And so eventually he made a, a, he made a sexual advance, just spending the night together. I was not expecting it. Wouldn't have gone there, but like, it's the same as what you said, David, it was this affirmation of my, his touching me was affirmation of my masculinity that I had never felt before. Mm. It, I, I had never felt a potency of you as a male are valuable and you are desirable. I had mm. never felt that before. And it was so, I mean, I just kind of couldn't push him away, that kind of thing. And, but I mean, the minute, the minute that he would leave my house after some kind of a, uh, an interaction physically like that, I'm, I'm already needing him again. Mm. Like I'm already not okay without him right there. Gosh. And that is no way to live. You know, I mean, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, are you still there, David? Yeah. Okay. Oh, weird. I, I'm having a, a thing pop up. Sorry. Um, the kingdom of God, as we know, is righteousness. So being in right standing with God, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I was not experiencing that. I was saved. I got saved at eight years old. I wanted to please Jesus, but but I was not experiencing that because all of this, uh, this emotional uh, intimacy deficit that now I'm trying to feed with non-godly things yeah. and none of it is actually working for me. That's right. You know, um, Leanne Payne used to teach about cannibal compulsions where yeah. you try to extract. In fact, I went after straight men almost exclusively. Yeah. yeah. And I was trying to extract their masculinity from them. Yes. To fill me with what I feel I didn't have. Mm-hmm. And Leanne uh, makes the point that that's why cannibals eat people. They eat people that they admire mm-hmm. in order to ingest that admired trait. Yeah. And the same thing's going on in the homosexual confusion. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds dramatic and gross, but I, I so can relate to that. that. I mean, and that's another, that's another example of um, of an argument for why we don't just say, yeah, just go, just go be gay. Like, no, I didn't want gay men. I didn't, I was, I was, what was so attractive to me was strong, healthy, confident. I, I am totally at peace with my masculine self, you know, and feel like I have all that I need men and they weren't trying to have sex with me, you know? Well, um, I used to go after the most popular and good looking straight male I could find in order to, uh, again, glean from them, their masculinity and their popularity with the women. You went through that too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what was, you know, the, uh, I I think again, because I was looking for a better me and because I felt like I came up short in so many areas, you know, because I was the little scrawny guy, not as strong always pick last on when they're picking teams in gym class for sports and all that. So it's like to see a, a, a picture of someone who did have the self-confidence, you know, he could talk to anybody. He could talk to the girls. 
to see one that it's like he got picked first for the teams. Like he had the stature where it's like nothing was going to threaten him because he was big enough to fend off the danger. All those things. That's that's what I was attracted to. That's that's because that's what I felt like I needed in myself. Yeah. And so, you know, as you were talking a minute ago about um, starting to align with what's true about us and practice it or go that direction. You know, I, I mean, I think you and I agree that mind over matter isn't going to get you far with this, like no. trying to train, change your sexuality, trying to, you know, to isolate the issues and deal with like that, that never worked. But partnering with what God has said is true about me, which means being open to having relationships with other males, you know, on a peer level, even if it's uncomfortable for me at first has brought so much life because guess what? I am male. I may not have the same muscles he does, and I may not be as tall as he is, and I may not be a carbon copy of the stereotypical male, but who is, you know, who, who meets all of those boxes perfectly, you know, um, and, and to, it, it has brought so much life and self-satisfaction peace for me to go ahead and say, you know what, I know I don't feel like, like, uh, I know that this doesn't feel true about me, but if I will dare to explore, if there's anything more there, I start to find out actually this really is me. Like I enjoy being in the company of men. I enjoy how I feel about myself once I've been on a men's retreat. Now the first one, the first uh, five hours of being on the men's retreat were fingernails down a chalkboard, but yeah. at the end of it, I walked away taller. <laughs> you know, I walked away full. I walked away self-confident um, and I think it's very sad to say that that is wrong because that gave me life. So allowing myself to, to venture into those areas um, is, has been part of my healing process. Yeah, I like to tell people uh, sexual brokenness is not about sex. Yes. And the mistake we make is in pursuing the this, this sexual behavior and the solution to that rather than God. Yeah. who has the power and the wisdom to tell us what to do. Yeah, and help uncover who who we most deeply are. You know, because he, he uh, things happen in our lives to kind of throw dirt over the top of who we are or make us look one way, but God knows specifically who we are. We are de designed very specifically. Yeah. You write in your book, instead of focusing on the challenges or insecurities we're facing with our sexual identities, we find transformation in our pursuit of intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. Scripture says that we become what we behold. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. We're mm -hmm. transformed into his image as we gaze upon his glory. Yeah. Then you say, if our focus is constantly on our own failure and sin, we can become stuck in that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. However, when we shift our goal from stop sinning to a vision of walking intimately with God, our focus changes. Now, that brings up a point. What what do you do at the failures along the way? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you're really an addict in mm -hmm. this area, um, it's it's going to be a, a hard road to hoe. Did I yeah. say that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it certainly can be. And I think that's one reason why we need each other. You know, and I want to talk about the specifically love of the father part, because I think that's where you were starting to go here. Go and that's so crucial. But um, I think repentance, let me first say that repentance is not the shameful thing. It's the thing that breaks the shame. Ah. Right. I mean, we know this by experience and I do, but the world out there largely doesn't because, you know, we're in a we're in a culture now where it's just well, just just love yourself and just affirm yourself. Well, mm. I got to tell you. That doesn't always work. Matter of fact, it usually doesn't. Like, if there's a reason why I am questioning how I feel about myself, I need to deal with that, and 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 not like not not just focus on it and have that become my truth, but to say, Father, I missed the mark with this, and and say, you know, would you forgive me? I ended up fooling around with that man, or I well, I looked at porn, or I was objectifying other men, whatever it was I was doing. And I feel like I'm going to do it again, Lord. Um, I, I feel like I almost certainly will. I feel like I can't help myself. But this yeah. was sin, and would you forgive me? And a lot of times we need to confess that, that sin to someone we trust, a mm. safe place, you know, um, an authority figure maybe, or a spiritual mentor, 
or something like that. But we need to confess our sins one to another that we may be healed is what yeah. the Bible says. So that it starts with confession and repentance of saying, I don't trust myself, Lord, but I am saying this is wrong and I'm responsible for my being complicit in it. And I am, I am nailing that to the cross and saying, this is not supposed to be part of my life and you paid for this and please take this from me. Mm. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. How do you pursue intimacy with God? What does it look like and what is the fruit of it? I mean, yeah, practically, okay. how do you do that? Yeah, that's good. Um, that, that kind of dovetails with where I think I was trying to go. Uh, there's, there's so many ways we can do it. I think it's, it's about the heart. Like, am, am I trying to just get my, am I trying to gratify myself or am I trying to follow another person? Am I trying to follow Jesus or am I trying to just get what I want? And one is successful and one is not. So when I have a savior and a Lord that I have decided I'm going to follow, then I start getting my needs met and I start to experience intimacy because he is relational. We're mm. first of all made in his image. We're made in the image of God. So we actually are, we're not him, but we are a lot like him. And it's so much easier for me to find myself by looking at him. Because if I'm looking here at what my current state is, that's an imperfect state. Yeah. But he is perfect and he's Great like point. us. Yeah. I mean, we're like him. So the more I stare at him, and the more I, I, uh, I mean, he's not going to reject us. Like he is holy and we of ourselves aren't. But when, we, the, when the more we stare at him, like that scripture you're quoting, we're becoming like him. And, and, and he is, I think, removing these barriers between me and him. He's, he's helping um, me let go of the place. That, you know, he's helping bring healing that would separate me from feeling like I can approach him or that I can be connected to him. And, and so some of that happens, and we would say the prayer closet, or just in our own prayer time with the Lord, it certainly happens in worship. I have a friend that says worshipers get well. I mean, the, uh, worship became a very big part of my discipleship journey. I mean, in my car, all the time, I had worship music going, unless I was in a meeting with somebody, you know, because it was washing me, and it was reminding me of my connection to the Lord and of his thoughts for me. And, and that it was activating that love, that romance kind of it, keeping that going, you know, um, mm. between me and him. But then I had different men in my life that came in and, and saw me and had a place for me that I could, you know, they didn't, ha they didn't have a struggle with homosexuality. Mm. Um, and, and, and no one had trained them on here's how you deal with someone who struggles with, you know, homosexuality. <clears throat> they just were godly men that were walking in purity and righteousness and um, had had grace for me, <clears throat> kind, mm. strong men. And so I would sit with this one man, uh, this pastor at my church, he would meet with me, God bless him. <clears throat> every Saturday morning for probably a year, almost every Saturday morning, we would sit in, at a coffee shop for an hour or two. And that was my chance to say, here I am. This is the me that I can give account for today. And so I looked at porn all weekend and objectified men mm -hmm. and he'd be like all right man he like let's get that onto the cross let's let's yeah. confess that let's pray through that together his eyes didn't change he didn't start he didn't start looking at me through different eyes he's like well yeah that's sin let's get that up onto the cross that's not that's not you that's something you did it's not who you are and he'd be like i'm sorry but you're just still you're just a man of god you were a man of god last week when i saw you you're a man of god this week you did some things that represent your fallen nature, but that's not who you are. You're a new creation in Christ, Ken. Mm. All those things are dead. You tried to resurrect that old man, maybe because you were scared or you felt insecure with whatever was happening in your life that week or that day, but we're going to let that guy go back to being dead and your identity is in Christ. Mm. And he would just reinforce to me who I am. And, mm. and it was the love of Father God coming through an earthly father. Mm, that's beautiful. Isn't that amazing? And I got to, I mean, the way I see it now is I actually, because, and this is what's so important for the church to understand, because he refused to see me through a worldly perspective, and instead he was seeing me through a godly uh, lens of like who God had made me to be, I eventually was able to borrow that lens from him. Mm. 
He saw me more accurately than I saw myself. I was looking at my behavior, but God doesn't look at, like, God doesn't identify us by our behavior. He identifies us with, by how he created us, you mm -hmm. know? And so that, that, the power of that loving and faithful discipleship that sees through heaven's perspective, not through an earthly one, like 2 Corinthians 5, 16, talking about we no longer regard each other according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He was, and, and then we are now no longer, uh, you know, that we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. That, those two scriptures are right next to each other. Mm -hmm. He was doing that for me, and it allowed me to see myself as who I really am. And once I started to see and believe that I'm, a, I'm not a gay man, I'm a man. Mm -hmm. I'm a man of God. It was much easier for me to start to experience what typical men experience. Yeah. You know, I've I found in my own life that uh, I I use people as part of my fallen nature. I don't even know that I'm doing it most of yeah. the time. If I knew that I was doing it, I would stop. But I do it all the time, and I use God just the same way. Mm. And so my initial attempt at uh, being healed was to pursue God, not for knowing Him, but yeah. for to get my problems fixed and. Yeah. That's really all you know when you're starting, and there's really nothing wrong with that. As <laughs> right. long as you transition into pursuing him because you want to know him. Yes, that's so beautiful. And so my experience and so many others that I know, don't miss the romance. You know, I mean, it's not a sexual thing with God, but it's an intimacy thing. Yes. And it's powerful. It's blissful at times. Yes. And, and we miss that if we're merely trying to get him to pay our rent or you know, do the thing or even heal the thing. And I love all that. I, God cares about all that. You know, um, yeah. he's way more, he's the only way that we are capable of even getting those practical needs met in our lives. But the, 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 the root, I'll tell you the gift of homosexuality is that the only way through it, the only way out of it is by deep intimacy with Christ and with the body of people that he put in our lives. And so those of us that this has been our biggest challenge when God attaches himself to that and I let him and I, I develop that intimate romance with him, I have the potential then of actually being healthier or more peaceful, more joyful, more self-assured of who I am than people that didn't have that challenge because mine was so yes. intense. I had to fight for it, right? I had, yes. I had to go to him deeply for it. I, could know, I couldn't muddle through. Yeah. And so that's the gift for anybody out there watching that, that ha this is your struggle. Let me tell you, you, you will be, if you'll keep following Jesus, you will be one of the most intimately satisfied people on the planet. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of people think, well, I can't pursue God because he's mad at me. He doesn't like me because of what I do day in and day out. I can't stop. And so I'm afraid to approach him. Uh, because I don't want that look of disappointment. Mm -hmm. I don't want that judgment. But it says in Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, if you seek me with all your heart, I will reveal myself to you. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. say if you live a holy life, I will. No. He says, if you seek me with all your heart, I will. That's right. Yeah. And we are to come boldly before his throne of grace to receive mercy and find help in time of need. And I'll tell you what, David, that's one of the, one of the most life-changing points with regard to this whole topic in my life is that, and I'll tell you, this is going to sound like heresy to some people, but consider it, okay? Um, my, my mentor told me back when I was just really fighting through, like trying to come out of the habitual sin and stuff, he said, well, Ken... Don't go sin. Don't go look at porn. D don't, don't lust. But if you're going to, <laughs> then you need to invite the Holy Spirit into it before, during, or after. And yeah. I recommend doing it before. <laughs> but, but this is the part we think that we can't invite. I mean, I, I had to be at a place, David, where, I mean, I would, this is crazy. I would be watching Christian television and masturbating and fantasizing about uh, uh, about men while I'm doing that. Okay. I, wow. I was such in such a swirl. I'm trying to pursue God, but I was so bound. Wow. And I'll tell you one of the biggest breakthroughs was when I dared to do what felt terrible or <laughs> awful, which I, I started to say, well, Lord, I don't seem to be able to help myself. I, I, I guess I'm going to end up doing something sinful here. 
So I'm going to invite you into it simply because my mentor told me to. It makes no sense to me. It sounds like something that inappropriate to invite you into something so unholy. But I'm going to invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and just be here with me as I sin. And I'm telling you what, over time, that started to change things because when you invite God into something that you don't want, you know, you're not supposed to be doing, it changes your experience of that. Yeah. And it made him Lord and Savior over that part of my brokenness instead mm. of myself. Because yeah. don't you think, David, we miss so many people find themselves unable to break away from this um, because we're, we have a Savior, but we're really trying to clean ourselves up by our own self-effort yeah. in order to be acceptable, and it will never happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, also a big turnaround for me was discovering God as he really is as opposed to what I thought he was like. And this is this is why people don't pursue God is uh, they see him in a false light as some ogre, as some judge mental yeah. is going to hit them over the head with a whip or something. Yeah. And, and that's why they don't pursue holiness. But if they pursue holiness and pursue him for mm -hmm. him to reveal himself to them, when he does reveal himself to them, he is infinitely more beautiful and wonderful and desirable than any sin you've ever done. 1,000%. Yeah. Absolutely. You write in your book, uh, God made us male and female, and it is through intimacy with him that we begin to discover the fullness of who we are. When I was striving for the attention of other boys, I was desperately trying to define my identity by someone else. Mm -hmm. And that someone else should be God. Yep. It wasn't, until I be, it wasn't until I began to see scripture as an on-ramp to connect with the person of God that yeah. I could begin to feel his delight in me. Mm -hmm. The Bible became a crucial instruction tool that God has provided me. Mm -hmm. You know, that gets left out so often that the importance, the critical importance of the Bible and, mm -hmm. and immersing yourself in it on a regular basis, because mm -hmm. if you haven't... Uh, receive the gift of the words of wisdom or words of knowledge and a lot of these spiritual gifts. Uh, the Bible is a re revelation of God and you can Big at time. least do that much. That's right. That's right. It's an anchor, isn't it? And, and it's, it's an owner's manual written by the owner, the creator. Yeah. And so, and you know, people like us, you know, if, if this is your struggle, it's like, you're trying to find who I am. And, and it's so you can, you can eventually, once you realize that God's not trying to, if he's trying to kill you, it's so he can resurrect you to a better life. Let's just say that. And so if you can finally lean into, actually, he's good. I'm not, David, that's the, that's the, it's in the book. That's one of the biggest revelations of my life that catalyzed this journey for me was when I realized, oh my gosh, he's good. He's good. And, and so then I, I was able to read his word through a different lens and to start to know him, to trust him. Because before, I, 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 my thought was God or Father God is the one that was th throwing lightning bolts down at me whenever I missed it, even by a little bit. But then when I started to experience, no, he's good. He's kind. You know, he's gracious. All that. He's merciful. I started to experience that. Then it's like I want to know more about him. So then it's like I have my Bible and I'm, you know, I'm just like devouring it to find out what else is true for me. What else he offers to me what his nature is like, uh, our friend, you know, our mutual friend and my ministry partner, Elizabeth Wanning, she accidentally left a lesbian life behind. Uh, and she'd been in the lesbian community for, I don't know, 12 something years, something like that. Totally had, you know, owned that identity. And as she, all, she simply felt led to start reading the Bible again from, she, she had a seminary degree at this point. Okay. So she, she knew a lot about God. Yeah. But she would say that she didn't know God personally. So she felt led after receiving a prophetic word that read her mail. She then realizes, oh, my gosh, God can be known. And he and that must mean he knows me. Yeah. And so she starts reading the Bible. She got a new Bible and a highlighter and she started in Genesis. And before she got to the end of the Bible, she was simply looking for what is the character of God? Mm -hmm. Who is he? What is he like? Yeah. By the time she got not even to the end of the Bible, she was so undone by who he was and what that meant for her that she, she now no longer could, could go into the gay bar and have the same experience. She would feel 
like the, the all the warm feelings went away when she went into the gay bar and when she would go into the church that she had in the church she had found she felt bu- buoyed and so she accidentally mm-hmm. left behind her her lesbian identity merely because of looking at who father was and Gosh. it it began to yes. father her and to tell her who she was yeah because when you discover god is altogether lovely Yes. Uh, you repent of the thoughts you've had of him, and he manifests himself in that repentance and in that new focus on loving him. And, and his presence literally heals things in you. I've yeah. had many experiences where I've called upon him, and all he did was manifest his presence in the room, this weighty kebab yeah. that happens. And I was healed. And sometimes I didn't know what I was being healed of. I just knew that yeah. his presence was healing me. Yeah. I, I, I know I can Beautiful. give you one story of that. Uh, John Wimber prayed for me once. I used to go to his church. Wow. And I, when he laid his hands on my head, the power of the Holy Spirit just sort of coursing into my body, just filled my body. And I was just out of seminary. So I was really looking to see, looking for heresies and things. And okay. So I said to myself, Spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So I locked my legs <laughs> so I wouldn't fall backwards, you know? Yeah. And uh, and the spirit left instantly. And then I went, oh, no, that was the spirit. Wow. Because he left when I, when I resisted him instantly. Mm-hmm. So I said, please come back, Holy Spirit. Yeah. And he came back and filled me again. I fell down uh, lying on the floor mm-hmm. and... Uh, unable to move. I guess I could have if I really wanted to, but I didn't yeah. want to. Sure. And I said, God, what are you doing to me? You, it feels like you're operating on me. Yeah. And uh, what are you healing? I said, and he said to me, uh, I'm not telling you this one. I'm just healing it. Wow. And it was, it was his presence and it was healing me of something. I know not what, <laughs> But I was being healed of something very significant for that scenario to have even come about. Gosh, so I wish we're going to have to have you back, Ken, uh, because I would love to. Uh, we're out of time. And I just, again, this book is so wonderful. Uh, mm. The Journey Out, How I Followed Jesus Away from Gay. Uh, um, get this book and read it and uh, be transformed as you apply the principles that are found in the book. Um, thank you so much, Ken. Tell us again how people can contact you. Mm-hmm. You can get the book through thejourneyout.me or um, equippedtolove.com is our resources for those on a journey themselves out of LGBT or like for church ministers, pastors, leaders. And then if you just are someone with a testimony or if you want to hear or see some other testimonies, you can go to changedmovement.com and just see a bunch of the testimonies and all Pretty much all those expressions have a social media as well, if you wanted to look there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming. And I just want to encourage you all to uh, listen to this podcast again and again and again, because there are so many diamonds in it. So many things that you may just skip over uh, just because, you know, you're not thinking straight or whatever. You don't think it's that important. But I can assure you everything that we've talked about today is very important in in getting free from bondages, homosexuality or anything else. It is the purpose of life to be intimate with the Father. That's why you were born. And that's where you will find your identity and be set free from the things that bind you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Remember, much of Dr. Foster's teaching has been taken from his new book entitled Sexual Healing Reference Edition, available at our website, masteringlife.org. This podcast and our many other resources are available because of our donors. If you are one of them, thank you. If you would like to join in supporting us, please visit masteringlife.org. 